Hey everybody, welcome back to Sex, Drugs, and the Epigenome. I am back again, of course, with Dr. Seeds, and gosh, we have such a good show planned today, right, Doc? We're just going over some bullet no notes. You don't know all the surprises I have in store for you yet, but I can already tell you're ex as excited as I am. <laughs> so I hope everyone had a really great Labor Day. Real quick, before we get started, we have some very exciting announcements. Uh, first, Dr. Seeds' uh, book on, on peptide therapy. It's the, very, it's the world's first book on peptides has officially launched. I will have the link where you can buy this book on Amazon and Barnes and Noble in the description of this podcast. So click on there. By the way, this podcast is a video podcast as well as audio. So if you haven't joined us on video yet, look for Sex, Drugs, and the Epigenome podcast on YouTube. You will find us there. But otherwise, listen on. One last announcement that we have is uh, in kind of conjunction, and maybe Doc, you can say a couple of words about Peptide Therapy Foundations, but this is a digital course, both for health practitioners and for those just interested in learning more about peptide therapy. Dr. Seeds made a very comprehensive digital course. It's about 13 modules long and just clocking in under nine hours where you can learn about the foundational peptides that he uses in his practice that goes over some very, very specifics on, uh, very important specifics on the use of this peptide, the pathway, the dosage, as well as if they have some side effects, noting those. Doc, do you have anything else that you wanna say about Peptide Therapy Foundations? I think it's just a good overview of, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good summary of the book and it follows the book to, uh, in a way that makes it, I, I think, uh, makes them work both well together. And uh, I think we just spent a lot of time in, in really pulling out some of the important highlights of the book and making it more relevant in the discussion, uh, teaching type of mode of where people could walk away with some good bullet points and, and some uh, information that they could apply immediately in understanding you know, what our message is about each of these peptides and how they relate to cell efficiency and cell senescence and metabolic flexibility, all the big things that we, we try to, um, the message we try to push here in, in a different way, I think in looking at where medicine is really focusing in the future. And uh, I think it's, I don't, I don't think it's provocative. I think it's right on the money in bringing people up to date about the science of where we're at in understanding how the cell is so important and the mechanisms of the cell in um, guiding um, cell efficiency and, and flexibility and making our lives better um, to adapt to stress, to adapt to viruses, to adapt to um, basically anything. And, and I think we do an excellent job in, in pushing that message forward and it makes it, um, it really flows well. And I really appreciated the time that we put into that to make this, I think, a top quality um, a video series that highlights again the important points of most of the basic peptides that are important in considering when you're looking at all of these um, aspects of uh, improving cell health. And it's a uh, again, it's a nice tie-in with the book, which is um, expands a lot more in, into other areas, but it really is a nice combination together. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. I love that you said it's not provocative because everyone that I've spoken to that's new to peptides sees it like a very provocative thing, but little do they realize peptides have been around for ages well, and ages. I, yeah, I think that's the, I just think if people just don't understand, you know, we're, we're talking about 
real mechanisms, peptides are, you know, we know of over 7,000 of them in the human body. And we, their enzymes, their ligands, their hormones, their receptors, uh, their signaling agents. And we're now in an era of where this knowledge has everything to do with precision oriented approaches to improving cell health. And when you understand the relevance of these uh, pathways and how to improve cell signaling when needed um, based on the efficiency of the cell, uh, boy, you can go a long way in, in, uh, in really changing, I believe, changing the uh, health of every human being on this planet. And we should bring up also dogs. <laughs> and kids. <Animals. laughs> uh, that, that is a really nice segue into the topic of today's podcast, Doc. So thank you for that. Uh, today's topic is something that's dedicated to my best friend's new baby and of course her kids, uh, but also all the other parents out there. There are a lot of you. We're going to focus for the next you know 30 to 45 minutes about kids health. But real quick before we do, just a check in on last week's challenge that Dr. Seeds put in front of us. And that was to put my beautiful 10 pound dog, Toby, who's kind of a monster too, uh, but putting him on a raw food diet. So uh, I did this for a week and a couple days now. And I've got to say, doc, it, the, I, first of all, I messaged you like three days after we pushed him onto this diet. And I was like, Toby's, Toby's looking cuter. Like his, his fur lightened up. It got so soft because before he was this wiry, like uh, kind of a wiry dog. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I just don't have a very soft puppy. But he's so soft now. <laughs> it's the cutest thing. And because his fur is soft, I don't know if it, it made him just like a lighter shade of of beige, but he's so cute. And his eyes, they're huge eyes. They're brighter and just overall super cute. There's, there's no other way to describe it. But also his, the biggest change that I saw was in his weight. He's no longer like fat because he was kind of fat before. Now he's just like leaner and just denser. He got like muscle or something happening. Um, so <laughs> I've been just like, what is happening to my dog? And this is, this is not a lot of time that's gone by. I just have to say, I'm in, in, in awe. <laughs> it's, you know, it's all about, again, realizing the nutrients that the cell needs to be at its most efficient state. And we know with animals, the, the raw food is absolutely the way to go. And Unfortunately, all these packaged and, uh, type of foods have, are, are not, these processed foods are, are what are putting our animals into diabetic states and immune states with diseases that we see in humans and, and cancer, significant cancer rates in, in animals. And you've just taken a huge step in, in changing that uh, those substrates, meaning those sources of energy for the cell, for these, for your dog, you, you've changed the game there. And, and you, you realize, you know, this is a great example of what's happening in our world today of, you know, all the things we eat out of boxes and cans and, uh, and junk processed stuff that is fast food. Here. Yeah. You know, yeah. 80 percent of what's in a grocery store. Oh. Um, it, it's, this is a perfect example for you to see how diet can really be that significant. I mean, diet food is like a pharmaceutical. It's no different. It's your, this is something that is driving the efficiency of the cell. It's driving the, everything that we talk about in improving cellular health is all about these, the food sources, the proteins and the fatty acids and the carbohydrates and how those, what forms they are able to get them in. And I'd ask you this, 
I'd say, have you noticed anything about Toby's mood? You know, younger dogs get oh, a little yeah. crazy when they're on these, not crazy, but they're very hyperactive. And He's crazy. I, <laughs> I wonder, wonder if you've seen any changes in, in the mood of the dog. Yes. So, so Toby, we, we, many people nickname their dogs, you know, monster, but we call him the Toby monster because every morning like clockwork, as soon as he wakes up, the first thing that he does after he takes his morning, you know, relief is bring a toy and just throw it on our heads. And he's knocking our heads with his paws and he's, he's just freaking out because he needs to play. I don't know. And he, he will, he will terrorize us for like an hour and then he'll start to give up. But now it's like he, he, he goes and does his thing in the morning, comes right back up to bed and he sleeps. He's just like super, super chill, which is Maybe. crazy right? in a week. So well, Doc, is it, is it changes this fast just because he's so small? Cause he's Absolutely. a 10 pound. Well, well, he's in a growth state too. So, so yeah, some of these changes can be very fast just by changing the food, you know, the, the food source. Um, and I, I can't wait for you to see the continued improvements, you know, in, in his um, alertness, his, his, I, I like to call it mood, but his activity level, I would say, you know, is he hyperactive or is he more controllable and how well does he listen? How, how well can you, you, you work with him and training him? I think you're gonna see all of these things significantly improve. Uh, but the fur and the eyes and the no draining, all of those things are big indicators that you're absolutely on the right track. That's awesome. Well, speaking of things, living beings being in a changing state, that is a really nice <laughs> segue into talking now about kids' health. This is a big topic, um, and it's really for the parents, of course. But um, we had mentioned a couple of things before we started recording. So, Doc, I'd love for you to kind of work through that list with me, the most important things for kids' health. Um, and then I'll, like, pop in our, our, our questions as you go. But, Doc, what's the first thing that you want parents to really pay attention to? I mean, I think first and foremost is always going to be sleep schedule for, for young kids. And it's not only the sleep of, of an eight, a, a guaranteed eight hours of sleep, but it's always a consistent bedtime, consistent same time bed. And that can make a dramatic change uh, in absolutely everything we profess, you know, about improving sleep cycles and improving um, the, uh, the, the things that go wrong when kids don't get the right sleep because they're in a growth phase also. There's a lot of things that are changing. You know, they're, the, circadian, the circadian clock, the centralized circadian clock is so focused on getting the right signaling, you know, the morning and, and not being up late watching TV or being on a computer, all of those things can affect uh, the circadian rhythm of um, the body, specifically in the brain, the, the, the master pacemaker, where if that's disrupted, it affects all of the peripheral uh, circadian clocks. And that can have, over time, can have significant effects on cell efficiency. And, um, and metabolic flexibility. So those are things that you've heard me profess um, just, just in talking about um, keeping the, uh, the cell in the best state it can be and to avoid immune compromise and all the bad things that can happen uh, when you lose that control. And these are easy habits to get kids into especially with the school year and uh, with how this COVID issue is keeping more kids at home, uh, where they're gonna be even more focused on a screen uh, that you, we really pay attention to this later evening activity of having them involved in video games or even television later. I, I really believe that 
and I think data shows us that this light disruption can make a difference in that circadian rhythm aspect of the brain and will certainly affect your sleep. Because sleep for kids is, 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 the, is number one on the list uh, because of growth and repair of, of the body. And that is, uh, that's probably one of the, the biggest uh, things you can control and, and get your kids into a good habit. I just thought of a crazy question and you might roll your eyes at how stupid this is, but you were mentioning things about, you know, the, the sleep obviously being the, the time of repair and, and growth, especially in that growth phase of being a kid. Um, me, one, I, I, I was playing video games very late into the night. Is that why I'm so short, Doc? <laughs> that explains a lot about you. <laughs> oh, I don't think, I can't say that. Um, you know, that's a stretch. Um, but it, it definitely didn't help you. Let's put it that way. Um, Is there a lot of brain kind of, uh, at what age does, does the brain continue to kind of grow? I guess is a, the <laughs> most medical term that I can come up with. Well, the, the brain is going, it's always, it's learning. So it's continuing to go through, develop new pathways, neuroplasticity of the brain continues up into the early 20s. So this is something that is the, the brain continues to go through repair, um, stem, stem cell activation in the brain to develop new pathways with new, new learning that is really important. Um, in, uh, in the development of, of children. I don't, think, I don't think a lot not of only, Not only that, but also the immune system. If, if we're not getting that proper amount of sleep, we're gonna affect the immune system also. And that's another, that's another important aspect of something where the family can control the immune modulation of a younger child in favor of better health especially in times like this of where we're dealing with uh, viruses like COVID and the influenza virus coming up also. So we're going to be, have a double whammy here. Sleep is going to be very, very important. And sleep is you, cause you, I brought up the, the growth thing, but really I was getting to like um, the brain, right? This is something that I don't think is at, at the normal people think about in their kids' health. You know, they want to make sure they have, they have their kids fed, healthy, they do their homework and go to school, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not thinking about, or at least I'm not, in the, the growth of the brain and therefore the reason why video games at night might not be the best thing. What about, Doc, the blue light glasses? Do those so, help at all? Yeah, so there's, there, the blue light glasses, the blue blockers can be helpful in, uh, in, and that has something to do with what I discussed about the uh, circadian clock in the, in the suprachiasmic nucleus uh, or the hypothalamus, the, the uh, signaling, it controls certain light waves that can get back into the eye and through the uh, optic nerve. The, the, there are other type of glasses too that people have tried to promote different wavelengths that also could potentially be important. Um, there needs to be a lot more data on that to, to be significant, but the blue blockers can be effective definitely with the screen um, at nighttime. Nice. So that, that, that can make a difference. So a little parenting hack might be to get your kid who's, if you have trouble getting them off video games at night, just get them a real dorky pair of blue light glasses. <laughs> Right. And threaten taking a photo of them. <laughs> it can make a difference with that and with television. You know, there's so mm. many uh, there's so many visual effects that are changing in video games and in in some of these movies that younger people are watching now that uh, definitely can have that effect on the absolutely. The, I remember, I remember seeing warnings on certain movies like action films where if you have epilepsy that this, it's a warning that it's these the lights have been known to cause seizures and 
crazy things like that. But I, I totally get you. What about Doc? Okay. What about it's just talking about the screens for a second? Is and this is uh, uh, I don't know if it's just with Asian parents, but they as kids we would always be right up close to the screen and be looking at that. Is that as bad as my mom would badger me for? Is that as bad with your mom what? My mom would always nag at me to, to back away from the screen because I'm always like this up close watching TV. Well, I think it's so you're getting a greater intensity of all of that light ah. at night. Um, that's the only thing I would say, again, is this disruption of this circadian clock. Um, Mom's right yet again. It, the farther back you are, you've also got other radiant light, darker, it's not as intense into the um, optic nerve. So I think it does, I think that does play into, uh, in, into the, again, the disruption of, of the circadian rhythm. The, the other thing is being in, you know, an office setting at nighttime with the bigger lights. Uh, that's also yeah. something that can be, have a significant effect. The later wow. you stay up. Because they have fluorescence in school rooms too. Like they're, they're just really cheap lights. So, yeah, the, during the day, that's not as much of an issue. I'm just I talking see. about because you're really, you know, we're all based on the rotation of the earth, which is oh, about 24 hours. And the same thing with light and uh, daylight and nighttime. And we've evolved based on that first light coming into the eye and then through the optic nerve to the suprachiasmic uh, nuclei that start this production of genes. Um, they activate genes that start turning on pathways. And what we don't- the lights have, do. Excuse me? The, the changing of the lights? That, yeah. that Wow. Yes. Yes. And, and that's, uh, that's something that we, we don't want to overstimulate at nighttime when the brain needs to turn things off. I mean, that's part of what melatonin turns off the circadian clock. Um, you know, th this is an issue with people that are blind because they no longer have those, that, that signaling the same as, um, as uh, you and I do. And so their circadian mechanisms get altered also. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's fascinating. So really, even your, even your screen, you know, now that you, you these uh, phone companies have done a much better job of changing the screens to make them nighttime oriented so yeah. they're darker, so you're not getting that bright light. Um, and and those, those things really do make a difference. If, if you look at sleep studies that have been done, that focus on how sleep can be disrupted, you can see that that the stages of sleep change, in particular stage four sleep and REM sleep can be affected. And these are very important aspects of sleep for younger people because that's when they get their growth hormone surge, which is the most important at the very beginning of the sleep uh, in that stage four. They need that for repair and rebuilding and, uh, and growth. And also for drainage of what we call lymphatic drainage from the brain that will drain basically, the best way to think about it is it's draining lymph from the brain or toxins from the brain at that, in that period of time. So it's very important that they get that sleep or they're gonna lose those mechanisms of repair. And they've, they've evaluated this and how light, certain disruptive lights and staying up later can affect those mechanisms of sleep where kids lose that time. And, and these lead to immune problems. They lead to diabetes. They lead to um, basically cellular inefficiency where a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, I think it's part of, I think it's linked also into uh, more of, um, you know, people with when they stay up later like that, they tend to want to eat later. Also, mm -hmm. eating later is not a good plan. Mm -hmm. Multiple reasons. 
basically altering again the insulin um, signaling that will increase the, the potential the potential of um, the um, developing type 2 diabetes based on uh, on that and also younger kids can run into more problems when they're eating later with uh, early uh, uh, regurg, uh, esophageal regurgitation, things that uh, we don't really pay much attention to, but are becoming more prevalent problems. Uh, and you're you're seeing um, you're seeing that in a lot younger people because of these eating habits, where you know it used to be dinner was eaten at five, six o'clock at night. And now that's being pushed back, pushed back, pushed back where you're seeing younger, younger kids eating at eight and nine at night. And I'm just gonna tell you that it's not a healthy way to get ready to go to sleep uh, when you're eating so close to bedtime because of uh, esophageal regurge um, and, and things like similar to that that can disrupt your sleep cycle and and lead to other issues all of these things that you're mentioning good nutrition obviously for for good nutritional value but they're all leading down to your number one thing for kids which is sleep which when we first started this conversation i thought you were going to say doc just from our past conversation i thought it was going to be nutrition but i was wrong you, you said you said it was sleep but i'm like what and, and it just, it makes sense. I, I can see why this is number one on your list of priorities. Just go and ask the teachers today what they've noticed the most about young kids or the teachers that have been teaching the last 10 or 15 years. And they'll tell you, they all come in tired and, and they have, they shouldn't. they're kids. It, it's, it's a problem and wow. it's, an, it's an easily, it's a fixable problem. And it's all about routine. Doc, what and about it's so coffee? funny. What's that? What about coffee and kids? Negative. It's probably not a good idea right now. It, it's no, like, like it, there's, there's no side effect of. Well, it's just that I, I think it's just a, again, they're, they're set up to be very efficient in how they utilize energy. Coffee can just be too much of a stimulant. Or younger kids as they're developing and they, they're just too you know they're they're at a they're in a place where i don't think that i don't think there are benefits at all to that other than um then unless it's utilized potentially at the right time but i don't think that's a smart smart plan does this you know. also apply to teenagers i believe so oh wow they're, they're, they're still in that phase of growth and um, and again, the, their cells are very responsive, and uh, it's something that I don't believe they need. Wow! So, so everything that you're saying kind of like like falls into place. Our last conversation about pregnancy, you wouldn't recommend any peptides for you, being, you know, the peptide man. Um, you wouldn't recommend that for a pregnant woman because they're in like the best state. Just like you're saying about kids, you. you you rarely say that, but when we talked about uh, briefly uh, earlier about the peptides, we'll get to that in a second, but you are basically saying they're, they're in a really good state. And you just said their cells can react very quickly and they don't need to be overstimulated. I love that. That makes perfect sense. Well, if you think about it, I mean, it, this is the most optimized state in, in it's where it's where learning is accelerated. It's where repair is accelerated. They have all of the growth factors. They have all of the peptides in their favor. And the goal should be to keep that momentum uh, at its highest. And sleep, as I said, is very important. And then nutrition and exercise are probably right next to that, in, in, or right below that in, in that category. Uh, to really make that triad of health for young kids. And it's, we've gotten away from, you know, if we talk about nutrition, again, the diet is so important for these young kids and, and how they're eating. And, and in fact, 
uh, the portion, not only that, but the portions of foods and more, more significant, uh, more processed type of carbohydrates, the wrong kinds of saturated fats, and uh, potentially not enough protein where they are in these growth phases where they need more protein. Um, and that can have a significant um, effect on, on growth. And I, this, is where, this is where we've talked about like the pro-peptide lifestyle of, of eating. And this really, really resonates well with children in teaching them right in the beginning to start when they're looking at their plate to really start teaching them about what a protein is, what a vegetable is, and what a carbohydrate, like, so a vegetable is a different type of carb, but, um, you know, where that, where that, those food groups fit, because if you eat your protein and your vegetables before the carbohydrates, that will absolutely control how you get these insulin surges uh, af after eating um, your meal. And what you want is a more, you want a more leveled insulin. You don't want a spike of insulin. If you eat your carbohydrate first before your protein and your, um, your vegetables, you've lost the battle and you've gotten that spike. If you eat your protein and your veggies first, you can absolutely control that spike and lower it. And that, that is, could abs just by diet change alone and looking at, and, and these are very important papers that have come out over the last couple of years, just focused on timing. You could, we could manage a ton of this type two diabetes in the world if, if we could focus on that. And that's something that's manageable. That's something you can control. That's something the parent can teach the child and the child can become very efficient in doing that. Um, and uh, it's, it also plays into, I mean, something we've talked about with adults in how we could also manage type two diabetes or obesity is after that meal, again, about controlling insulin, you get up and you move, you go out and you walk or you go ride your bike or you get outside instead of eating and then going back and playing video games or getting on your computer. You got to be active after eating. It, it, again, this can change that whole uh, spike type of insulin activity that I talked about where we want a more level uh, production of insulin. So we don't see these drastic changes in glucose because that's, that's where inefficiency is. And uh, we could do so much more with that if we really just changed a couple of things, meaning timing and activity, when your activity is after a meal, uh, it could be significant. That's awesome. Those are, those are such, such great tips, easy tips too. So when you're at a restaurant, just eat the bread last. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's um, absolutely right. What comes out first? Bread. That's bread. probably the last thing you want to eat first to control uh, that insulin. And, and, and Doc, just because I am not a, a health practitioner, I don't know why it's such a bad thing for insulin to spike. What's happening there? In the uh, most like layman's terms you can. <laughs> It's just about a bigger surge of glucose. It's, it's how glucose, which is the, what anything can be, what the carbohydrate can be broken down into or, or proteins through gluconeogenesis or fatty acids can eventually uh, be broken down into other sources of, uh, of energy for the cell. It's how that it's it's something where you just want to see you don't like to see big surges in in some of these hormones you want a more level playing field of everything because it just it affects the the cell in a, a much more efficient way where it can instead of getting all of a sudden a big load of of, of something it it gets a more um, dispersed 
amount of, uh, of glucose, basically. I see. So it's it, that that totally makes sense. You're like funneling it rather than like bam. Yeah. Get absolutely. all of this. Wow. Well, just looking back, Doc, to my go-to school lunch back in tw- over 25 years ago when I went to high school, I would eat a cup of noodles every <laughs> every lunch, or like those Pizza Hut breadsticks dipped in marinara was my favorite lunch of all time, and it was always like that. It was never it was never wow. anything that I was supposed to eat. Wow. But I did wow. exercise a lot. Well, it's you know. You're, you know, these are just that must be why are, I'm so short. These, That's are little, these are little things that <laughs> will accumulate and build and build and build. And uh, that's the problem that you people don't realize of how these things just build on themselves and then become issues later on in life, also. Right. So you're starting good habits that can, that I would try to tell you, you can absolutely change the destiny of the efficiency of how these cells work by those three things, sleep, nutrition, and activity Mm -hmm. after eating uh, could be significant. That is so, I love that. Um, And the science is behind it. The papers are there. So, so we, we didn't mention this, but, but it goes without saying you do not recommend soda ever in life actually. (laughs) No, I don't even think that exists in my home. Um, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's the, not any of the juices. I, I'm, it's, it's water, uh, tea. Um, I'm okay with kids with some teas, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know. Uh, the, what about and, what, go ahead. Uh, what about club soda, which is just carbonated water? I think that's fine. Okay, because that's like like LaCroix, Waterloo, those things are really, really popular and always in my house. <laughs> so I was curious. Yeah, I think that's funny. I, I, but basically just with you know, water, tea, um, what else? What am I missing? I, I, am a big, I am a big proponent in younger kids with milk, uh, more of the A2 milk. What's it A2 depends, milk? It all depends on the, cake, the, the type of uh, casein or the, the protein that they're getting um, and how that's utilized in the body and those that seems to come from more like Guernseys and Jersey cows they have a better type of milk product and um, that's a whole we should do another whole nother thing wow Jersey uh, like New Jersey cows yeah Jersey well they're called Jerseys and they're called Guernseys and they just have a better uh, fat makeup in uh, in the milk, wow. and they have the A A two type of uh, uh, protein, the casein so, protein. So it's cow's milk, but a certain cow. Correct. Wow! Yeah. How yeah. can you even tell where the cows are from? You've got to read the. You've got to read where your milk came from. Oh my God! I had no idea that this was a thing. Wait, so I heard that California cows are super happy. What about California cows? It depends what kind of cow it is. Again, <laughs> you know the the Holsteins are cows that have been. It's the most popular milk, but they're the ones that have been bred the most. Oh. And they've lost their. They have the A1 type of casein or the protein, which is seems to be more of an inflammatory type of product. Oh, wow! They, wow! Yeah. So so all of those things make a difference. Oh you, my gosh! Okay, so so this is a great bridge into my my biggest question that I had for you and you mentioned this uh, that the the biggest issue with kids is is the the GI issues right the gut issues eating a bunch of chips flaming hot Cheetos not good for the gut um, and probably causing a lot of constipation like my best friend's baby she is she she had to stop dairy because of constipation but what if she had switched to an A2 thing right a Jersey cow. You know, that may not, I mean, there are some that have lactose intolerance. I see. And, and so that can be a, a could, could be a factor. Um, the, it just depends. I, I think the milk product is important. Um, mm. And the, 
Uh, you know, we could get into this debate about raw milk, um, which I think is the ultimate because raw milk has the enzymes like people that are lactate deficient. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, they typically, they can drink raw milk because it has the enzymes in there to digest um, the milk where um, the milk that's homogenized and that, that is, uh, it, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm blanking here. Uh, the, the milk that's pasteurized, sorry, is, uh, it degrades a lot of the enzymes that come in that, the, the raw milk that are so important to make, to keep some of these biological active proteins viable uh, and some of the enzymes that are really important in helping you digest the milk you drink. So wow. there are excellent uh, raw milk facilities around the country. Um, they are state to state regulated. Some states don't allow raw milk. Uh, California does, um, certain states on the East Coast and in the Midwest and uh, in the Midwest do. And uh, that was something that all my, my children were raised on raw milk. Wow. And, uh, we, were, we were very, we were we used to go to a farmer's market and we would get the, the raw milk um, from a known dairy farmer uh, who was doing this for you know, 50 years. And uh, so it, it's all about your sourcing. Yeah. And understanding again, the type of cow um, that can make a difference. And, and then you've got a really good source of, um, of uh, protein and uh, carbohydrate mm -hmm. and a really good, because, you know, milk, if you think about it, milk is one of those, products that can cross um, species. You can take cow's milk and raise a dolphin. You can take cow's milk and raise, you know, a different species of mammal with cow's milk. That's a pretty incredible thing, you know, that you can, oh, wow. that milk crosses species. It just tells you of the power of um, the substrates that are in milk, and that's where that's where whey and casein protein come from. So there's a lot to that. Um, so hearing this, I would say that you are not a big fan of the nut milks. No, I I I, I think there are like walnut milk. I, I think there are places for all of that actually. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Um, I, I like some of those more specialty type of, uh, um, I like some of the ideas behind some of those. Absolutely, almond milk, um, walnut milk. Uh, I've tried, I've actually, we go through some of those routinely. Um, we kind of rotate through them. Mm. But I think there are pluses and um, pluses for all the way through with, the, with a lot of these products, absolutely. That's really cool, but for kids, the Jersey cow milk is. I don't think they're. I think the Jerseys and the Guernseys are your Guernsey. best. That's a um, funny word. Yeah, I know. And the yeah. Guernseys. I love that. <laughs> awesome. So, what about what about people dealing with and um, kids? This is a big thing, it, dealing with constipation. Yeah, I think that's a. Hmm. So. You know, there's the other aspect of making sure your children are hydrated enough, right? So they're not drinking a lot of Coke and things like this. Water is important during the day. Uh, activity is important. Um, and the right food is important. So uh, you can get in with a lot of those processed foods, you can get into a lot of issues. Uh, and, and with heavy carbohydrate diets, you get into a lot of issues with GI problems, and that's probably one of the higher problem, one of the higher um, issues of younger kids with uh, problems is a lot of GI issues, and uh, just the things we talked about: sleep, diet, and exercise can have a significant effect on that. 
The trifecta. I like it. The triad, yeah. <laughs> the triads are actually a mafia group, a very, very notorious mafia group in China. Really? Yes, the triads. Like this, like the Chinese version of the Yakuza. Yakuza, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> that's your Asian lesson, culture lesson today. Thank you for that, Karen. You're welcome, sir. Um, so let's get into peptides because um, I, I do want to mention that, that this for, for our listeners. Um, you don't recommend too many peptides, but which one do you recommend, Doc? Well, so there are some easy ones. Uh, there, are some, there are some relevant peptides that can be very important, especially in the, the younger, obese, diabetic children. Uh, there is a dipeptide that is out there as a supplement that, that you don't have to get a prescription. It's called L-carnosine. And L-carnosine has been relevant in studies of showing how we can reduce glucose insulin resistance and improve glucose tolerance of, of these people with just using L-carnosine. These are papers, these are pediatric papers that have, are, are really relevant and uh, have just as the, are just as effective as uh, things like metformin or um, similar other uh, ways to try to reduce uh, glucose. But, this is, uh, this is something that is good for the cell. It, it has antioxidant properties. It has chelating properties to work against metals, heavy metals. It has uh, buffering capacities to work as a buffer. Uh, it's an excellent peptide and it's, it's, it's very inexpensive and it can have significant ramifications in improving um, your child's uh, uh, aspects of, of a poor diet. And, it, and in fact, it is a, um, it's, it works even better in kids that are, have increasing end glycation products, which, are, which means they're, they're getting too much glucose. And these, the glucose does, this excess glucose can do things to change um, the, post-translational changes of proteins and signaling agents that, that lead to type 2 diabetes and the issues that ensue with that. And this is, this is probably, I would say this, in my mind, there is nothing better and more healthy than for a, uh, a, a, a child to take L-carnosine because it's been studied in the pediatric journals and it's been recommended as a potential treatment uh, instead of a drug. That's, a, that's amazing, right? Oh yeah. Um, so that's, that's a simple, no, in my mind, a simple way to get people indoctrinated into there are choices you have that you don't realize are out there that have that significant um, uh, ability to, to change the beginnings of bad things that happen when kids are in those processes on uh, in the wrong diet setting and not eating properly. And, um, Very cool. Yeah. I'm on Amazon right now and there are just a, a, so many brands to choose from. Is there one that you trust more because there it's just a long list and they're all slightly different. Some of them include other things. Yeah, I do. I actually, I do. I like, I like all of the, so um, I like Neutral Bio. Neutral Bio is typically all of their amino acids and, and products like the dipeptide L-carnosine, not carnitine, L-carnosine is, um, is well represented. And, I, and they, do a, they do a really good job, I believe, in getting pharmaceutical grade amino acids and and products, and they've always had a great reputation. I think they lead the market in that. So, and it's very inexpensive, as you said. Um, we don't have any affiliation with with Nutribio. I think we're, we're just 
Dr. Seeds is a fan of it, and and I I'm uh, it's in my cart. So <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, I I again, I think I I hope people appreciate. You know, we I try to bring out anything relevant. I I think that I use with my patients and uh, that I feel is something that not that others can't be trusted. I just feel they have a good track record and. Uh, and I know what they do with all their other products, and they're always top line, top of the line. Oh, and and you'd use on yourself and your family. I've seen this in your recall seeing it in that that lab of yours where you just try everything under the sun. <laughs> Little mad scientisty. It's fantastic though. You're trying it on yourself <laughs> before anyone else. Well, and you got to test that. Uh, you got, you know, they're it's relevant that these type of products need to be tested and, and looked at are they truly representing what they say is in that bottle that they're giving you and oh, it's scary out there what people don't know this is really really valuable stuff um so just some key takeaways right the the trifecta the triad right, of, of kids' health, as we call it, is, is sleep, number sleep. U, numero uno. Sleep at the top of the pyramid, and yeah. then nutrition, and then, you know, at the corner, nutrition and activity, right? Nutrition and activity, just as important, and on the level corner, right? Like, it's not a weird isosceles triangle, it's a, it's a equal lateral equal triangle. Lateral. Equal lateral. <laughs> Yes, high school geometry coming into use for the first time ever. Um, I like it. Folks, that is all the time that we have today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this, this fascinating conversation. First of all, I had no idea there were types of cows. So the weird word that you said, plus the Jersey cows, what was it again, Doc? Gurgy? Guernsey. Guernsey. Guernsey <laughs> cows, which is such a cute, funny word. It makes me laugh every time I hear it. Uh, and if you have pets, make sure we get them on the raw diet. Um, I will be listing my, what I did for Toby um, and how much I did for Toby based upon the last conversation in, in, the, in the description below too. So you can check that out. Try it for a week. Try this challenge for a week. Um, guaranteed you're going to see something similar, if not better than what, what my Toby monster has seen. So it's a, it's a game changer. It always. really is. It really is. And man, we, we do anything for our pets and, and the kids, the kids in our lives. So hope this was very valuable. Folks, just as a reminder, send all of your questions to Dr. Seeds, your, your canine questions, your feline questions, your, your, uh, you know, your toddlers or your teenage questions over to info at seeds.md. We will make sure to get those answered for you. I hope this was as enjoyable a listen as it was a conversation for myself. Thank you to Dr. Seeds for joining us again this week. Folks, we will be back again. Thank you, Doc. Hey, great to be with you, Karen, and great to hear how well Toby's doing. I can't wait to hear more about Toby. <laughs> I will keep you updated. All right, awesome. Bye. Bye-bye.